Hi, everybody. Look at this guy. He's Len <laughs> Casper, the new radio voice of the White Sox. Hi, Len. Hi, Jason. Uh, wow, right? Kind of an interesting uh, week. And uh, I am so looking forward to uh, hanging with you and laughing and doing great radio with DJ and some great television with you and with Stoney. And I, you know what I look forward to? I mean, I, I want the I want the pandemic to end as soon as possible. I think that's number one. But I can't wait to just be sitting on the plane and coaches in front of us and players behind us and they just just talking baseball, man. We we miss that so much. I would give anything to go into the Bard's room and go to the salad bar with you right now. And I don't even I don't even like I think salad bars are weird. <laughs> Honestly, like, why are we why are we sharing all this food together? Like we should we should all have individual plates. But I would I would do anything for something communal like that. And that's to be honest, that's what's so exciting about you coming over is um, that we're just going to have so much opportunity to share baseball together. Like we we've we've known each other for now 10 years, which is crazy. Uh, in 2014, I was just like standing in the back of your booth at Wrigley. You and JD invited me in, and I was like making weird jokes about his former high school teammate Tim Welsh, and then like left in the fifth inning because I felt like I was interloping. And now we're colleagues, and I couldn't be more thrilled. No, I I, I feel the same way, and we, we've made so many friends throughout the game, and people we will never work alongside specifically and to have the opportunity to actually do that is rare and special and it's something that i'm going to cherish uh, when i started full time uh, in the major leagues i got the the television job with the then florida marlins uh, john boog shambi was uh, on the radio with dave van horn and as you know we became uh, fast friends. And when when I left to, to come to the Cubs, uh, one of the hardest parts of leaving that job was being around Boog every day. And we've been great friends ever since. And uh, I just have all the great memories we had of, of hanging together on the road uh, when we were with the Mars. And then through that postseason, uh, which was insane. I'll, I'll never forget, I want to say after the game six, Marlins win over the Cubs. And we remember... <laughs> Uh, we remember what happened uh, that night. Um, we ended up at Tempo. Have you ever been to Tempo for breakfast? I've been in a Tempo because my grandfather drove one, but I've not been to, <laughs> to Tempo. So Tempo, people don't know, and you've got to try it. Uh, it's right next to Ditka's, and it's 24 hours, and it's like the best breakfast ever. And I think we were in there like 4.30 in the morning. And it's just like those little moments that you remember. Like, why would you remember going to breakfast at 4.30 in the morning? Because it was between game six and seven of the NLCS. Uh, so the, those are the kinds of things that I look forward to doing. I hope you like to stay up late on occasion. Uh, I do. <laughs> I do. But if there's a day game the next day, I'm that guy who's like, who says before the game, I'll have a drink after the game. And then like claims that the three hour, 12 minute game was too long and I have to go to bed. Well, that there's here's a little inside baseball. Uh, when you do stuff on the road and you make plans, my my rule is every individual in the traveling party always has kind of the first right of refusal uh, or, or always can change his or her mind. And, uh, you know, that can get a little dicey at times because sometimes big plans are made, but you have to be able to adjust on the fly. And and my thing is when, uh, when you invite somebody out, if they come great, if they don't want to, because they they need to get a good night's sleep, I'm cool with that too. Um, but the bottom line is we're, we're going to have a lot of fun, uh, just kind of exploring the, the American league. <laughs> oh my gosh. I have so much to show you in Detroit because you've never been to Michigan. Uh, so <laughs> I uh, have uh, what's your relationship with DJ uh, at this point? How well do you know him and how excited are you to be with him? Well, I've known DJ since, you know, I've been doing this uh, full time and pretty much every year, obviously with, with the Cubs, but even 
a couple of times with the Marlins and, and, and just going into their booth. And I think Farmio kind of uh, facilitated that relationship quite a bit. And so we've just become uh, friends in that regard. Uh, he actually played for the Brewers when I was in Milwaukee working at the flagship station, WTMJ. I'd like to tell you I have some old cassette tapes with a pre- or post-game interview with Darren Jackson, but uh, I don't think I do. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we have some common interests. Uh, we had a great phone call on uh, Friday, I believe, Thursday night. I can't, I can't remember how or when anything has happened here. <laughs> Uh, since the, since the start of December, but he he was over the moon. He was thrilled, and I just told him we're going to have fun. I said you're going to make me laugh. I'm going to find what what tickles you, and I'm just going to the, the worst possible moment find a way to to derail your beautiful analysis and 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 have you lose your train of thought. Uh, that that's the fun of working uh, baseball every day, especially on a local broadcast. Is you got to have fun. You got to be yourself, and you can't take yourself too seriously. What is uh, watching your press conference? And I was sitting here on mute and trying not to cry as you were talking about radio, honestly. Like, what is it about radio for you that touches your heart like it does? Well, unlike you, I was unable to, to, to stop the tears <laughs> for a minute talking about Ernie Harwell. Yeah, I, for whatever reason, I fell in love with radio when I was. 12, 13, 14 years old. And you, you can relate to the idea of, you have a much better memory than I do, but uh, I don't remember things kind of in the interim nearly as well or as vividly as I do the things that are kind of imprinted uh, on my brain back when I was that age. And, and I think baseball fans in particular really have that thing in their soul. Uh, there's a lot of bad music from the mid to early 80s, kind of the early MTV era that I still love just because I remember seeing the first Def Leppard video on MTV. So when I hear that song, like Photograph's a good song, don't get me wrong. But when I hear like Rock of Ages, which is eh, kind of a mid-level Def Leppard song, I still smile because I remember kind of where I was when I first heard that song. So listening to the radio back in 1983, 84, 85, uh, the Tiger games were not all televised, probably 60, 65. So to follow my team, I, I kind of had to listen to the radio. And I was fortunate that Ernie Harwell, the long time, I think he ended up doing 42 years uh, with the Tigers, uh, previously with the Orioles, uh, with the uh, Giants, with the Dodgers when they were in New York in Brooklyn, uh, and his partner was Paul Carey, who was called the voice of God. Paul Carey here. Ernie, thank you. Uh, th those guys were the voices of my youth. So Friday, when I was thinking about the next chapter in my life, it's like, I get to do that. I get to do that. That's amazing to me. It's still sinking in, and I hope it never quite sinks in. <laughs> Look, I, I love that. I, I, I grew up listening. Like I would, I would leave school early from junior high and high school sometimes to, to come watch the NCAA tournament. Like I was obsessed with the NCAA tournament. But as we were driving home, you'd hear it on Westwood One Radio, and they'd have the whip around show, and John Todges would do, uh, you know, cut ins and all this stuff. The first time I got to do the tournament on radio a couple of years ago and people thought I was crazy, but like I, I, there was something in my heart that day. Like I, I will never, ever trade this day for anything in the world. So I get, I get it. That's right. And, and uh, to go kind of off the beaten path a little bit, the, the other, as we're talking, like the other things about that time in my life are, are coming back. Do you, you, you might be too young to remember these days, but when I, by the day. <clears throat> when I was in junior high, high school, in the library, they had the daily newspaper. So I think it was the USA Today, uh, the Detroit Free Press, Detroit News, 
and the Morning Sun, which was the local Mount Pleasant newspaper. Um, but they had them on these sticks. Do you remember the newspapers? They would yeah. they yes. would hang them down, and so yes. they would be attached to a stick, and you'd have to go in. And so you know, it's kind of hard to steal a newspaper attached to this long, you know, stick. So for a long period, I would show up probably a good half hour early to school. And at the time, I mean, I, I walked to school. I was like three blocks away. And I would go into the USA Today and I would do the team by team notes. I would look at the, the pitching matchups that night. Uh, I remember getting the, the Sunday free press, which had all of the baseball stats of the week. Uh, I subscribed to the sporting news. So like, that's the other thing that comes back to me. And that was the, the radio companion where I kind of kept up with everything. And today now it's getting online and, and doing all of that uh, on your laptop or your, your iPad. Uh, but I miss those days too. And I attach that to Ernie Harwell and, and my love for baseball. Uh, as we talk here, I'm reminded that you and I did the two pandemic no hitters. How was, how was your pandemic? I, would, I joked on Twitter that we we're going to write a pandemic no hitter coffee table book. Do you want to do that? <laughs> we should. Yeah, we absolutely should. So how many no-nos have you called? Is that your first? What is, is this like, do I get like a jacket, like a starter jacket, like the SNL yeah. Host club? Yeah, it's my first. It's my first. How many you've done? Like you've done a bunch, right? Uh, that was my fourth and three of the four are really interesting. Um, well, all four. I mean, every no hitter is interesting. I called Jake Harry at a second no hitter in Cincinnati, and I believe that was the biggest blowout in a no hitter, sixteen to nothing. Um, and the Alec Mills one was twelve nothing, whatever. So the first no hitter I called was the first, and to this moment, I believe only a no hitter thrown uh, not in a home ballpark. It was a neutral site. That was the Carlos Zambrano no no against the Astros in Milwaukee. Uh, that was the Cubs' first no-hitter since 72. I called Cole Hamill's no-hitter with the Phillies, which was at Wrigley Field, and that was the first Wrigley no-hitter since 72, and it happened to be Hamill's final start as a Philly. So that made it unique. And then I called the Alec Mills no-hitter during a pandemic, and I called it remotely. You were in the ballpark, right? Yeah, we were we were in the ballpark, uh, thank goodness. And I know you you did it expertly from the monitor, but that had to have been strange, right? Well, I was panicking in the well in the seventh. I, I did tell JD, you know, this is an easy thing to do because if you're wrong, nobody remembers. But I I looked at JD in the seventh. I said he's going to do it, um, and and he wasn't quite sure. And I think we we all as broadcasters kind of there's, there's this touch point where you just start to get this this vibe that's that. He's going to at least take it to the ninth, and it's something weird may happen, but but it's it's getting really fun. Um, I was starting to panic in the bottom of the eighth and into the top of the ninth about the shift, and we had an all nine mo you know, uh, 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 monitor overhead. Overhead. The problem with that is. A lot of we had a couple really good shots from different ballparks, but a lot of the ballparks it was a bit blurry, and you couldn't quite make out who everybody was. I mean, I had a pretty good idea, and um, my buddy Zach Zaidman gave me a great tip. He said, "Always look at the socks," and he was right. And typically, the shortstop would have the high socks, and the second baseman um, you couldn't see the socks. So I would just kind of look. Okay, is that is that Arcia? Is that uh, you know? Is that Sogard? I'd have to do it for our team and say, "Okay, is that Baez? Is it Bodie?" What I was paralyzed <clears throat> uh, with was ground ball up the middle. Here's Bodie. No, that's Baez. No hitter, Alec Mills, and I'm going to go kill myself. Right, right. So I had to make sure that I knew who was going to field the ground ball. And sure enough, it was a ground ball up the middle, um, but I could tell it was Javi, and I got it right. And as you know, when you call a no hitter, the number one thing is to get it right. All the other things, the excitement, the, you know, acing it, you know, getting the A plus, getting the bonus points, all of that is gravy, but you get an F if you, if you get the, the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There were, the, I mean, Lucas struck out so many guys in the game, like, which sounds like a humble brag on behalf of him. I wasn't dispatched here to do that for him, but he, he, he struck out enough guys and there, there just weren't that many balls in play uh, at points in that game. But yeah, 
that moment when the ball came off the bat to right field and Adams running toward it, like off the bat, I thought it was a hit. I definitely mm. thought it was over. And so you watch the ball trajectory and I was, I was in the middle of getting excited for the moment that's happening, but also thinking like, oh no, oh no, this is gonna be eight and two thirds and nobody's gonna remember tonight for anything but the power outage that happened in the second inning. <laughs> and so I, I, the, it is, how would you describe the tension of doing a no hitter? Because we're not playing it, but I'm telling you, I felt like I was. Oh, it, it is. It, it, it's something. You really feel it. You're nervous for uh, the guy on the mound. Uh, as I said, you're, you're, you're starting to think about what I might say. You know, I, I never script it. Uh, in, in, in the Alec Mills no-hitter, here, here's a fun one. So JD and I uh, did a weekly podcast with the Cubs, and we got, I want to say, two current players during – the six game season, which was amazing. I mean, to get a player to spend an hour with us during this year was, was incredible. And uh, we did David Bodie one week and the next week we did Alec Mills. So this was like on a, on a Tuesday, we did, we did 45 minutes with Alec. And so Jason, I got every kind of biographical detail on Alec's life that you could ever want doing what we do. So th it was like, this gold mine. So as the game is progressing, we're kind of emptying the, the chamber on that stuff. And it kept coming back to me, college walk on. He, he, he kept walking past uh, the baseball team at Tennessee Martin. And he kept going, do I want to try this one more time? Do I want to try this one more time? And finally, he, he asked the coach and the coach said, absolutely. And then the rest is history. But I just thought at some point, you got to say something about that. Yeah. Uh, beyond, and then you're trying to still kind of call the game. Now, our game was a total like twelve nothing. I think Arcia actually pitched the top of the ninth. Uh, so the game itself, in terms of competitiveness, was way over. And you're trying not to let your mind wander. And the other thing that is hard to, to describe to people who don't do what we do, but beneath the surface, it's like a duck on water on a, a TV broadcast like that. So it's like, you know. Jason and Sony are doing their thing and Len and JD are doing their thing. And in your ears in the truck, it's just complete pandemonium. It's like, we need video of the area to no hitter. Uh, you know, Hey, uh, you know, graphics guy, make sure you get, so it's just, it's just insanity. And everyone wants to make sure that they they're buttoned up and they get everything right. So you're just trying to like kind of ignore that while making sure you're listening to them making sure you let your partner do his thing. And then it's like, oh, it's a no hitter. And oh, what monitor am I looking at? And if this monitor goes out right now, I'm, I'm in big trouble. So yes, it's very nerve wracking to say the least. <laughs> yeah, man, it was, uh, you know, I, I, I forgot, I was talking, Tom McCarthy from the Phillies had called me a couple days after uh, and was talking about no hitters with me. And he had, he had some other questions about just random stuff in baseball and what we were doing road games and things like that. But, you know, I I've talked to you and I've talked to him and I've talked to Brian Anderson and a couple other people. And I feel like a 12 year old because I'm like, yeah, it was my first no hitter. And y'all are like, ah, I've done seven of them. I've done five of them. And it's like, man, I, I couldn't even fathom having done so many of those because they're just so rare. They are. And in almost every case, uh, the one exception for me was Arietta because he had a 30 start stretch that I don't think we will ever witness again. And he literally took like eight, no hit bids into the seventh or the eighth inning. And so when he threw one, at Dodger Stadium, <clears throat> I think I was in a, I don't know if I was in the hotel or whatever it was. Sunday night right. baseball, so you weren't mm -hmm. doing it. Correct, uh, right, I interviewed him, I interviewed Jake and, and Miguel Montero in the dugout together for radio after that game, which was really neat. I just remember being in a, in a hotel elevator and he said, you know, I'm gonna throw another one. And I said, yeah, and I hope I get to call it, you know, <laughs> and he did. And I think even after he threw the second one, he told us, I'm, I'm going to throw a third. You know, he was just in that in that mode. So that was not shocking at all. But all the others, you're just not thinking 
that that's going to occur. It, it doesn't even enter your brain when the game starts. Um, they have a lot of media press boxes do a thing called a no hit pool. Are you familiar with how that works? Uh, I, I, I don't exactly, but I do have a story about pools in the press box to share with you when you're done with your story. It's, it's really simple. Um, you need 10 people to do a no hit pool uh, and you can use playing cards or, uh, you know, just a piece of paper with essentially zero through nine. And what it is, is the zero, I believe, is the no hitter. And then the one through nine is the batting order. Okay. Everybody puts in a dollar. I suppose you could up the ante and, you know, throw in two dollars. But if you did it, if you had a dollar a piece, it would be ten dollars. And it's just kind of a fun thing to follow. And if the leadoff man gets the first hit, whoever has the one wins the wins the pot. And so what I think happens, it's after the third inning. Okay. So usually the no-hit pool starts in the top of the fourth. And, and in Milwaukee, when I was a young buck reporter uh, back in my early 20s, we did a no-hit pool every night. It was, it was really fun. We did something similar in AAA. Uh, we, we had a home run pool. Whoever hit the last home run, we would put all 18 names in the batting order in a hat. We barely had 18 people in the press box, but boy, was it great fun. <laughs> Uh, And then you put in a dollar. But the greatest part of that is some days you don't get a home run. And so what happens is carryover, right? So 18 becomes 36, becomes 54. And I mean, there have been some really large AAA baseball home run pool pots to the point where like you're – you, you win one of those big ones and you're, you're obligated to bring in food for the press box the next day. And you, it's actually a losing proposition. <laughs> right. You can't pay the rent that month because you won the home run pool, which is a tragedy. Um, I want to know, you've been watching the Sox from the other side of town for so many years. This is a very specific question, but I just wonder, what do you think of Tim Anderson as a guy who's been watching from the outside? This is exactly what I said. And I got some pushback from Cub fans. And I want to pick your brain on the Cubs White Sox thing, because the one area that's always fascinating to me and and typically gets written around the Crosstown series is you try to make up an all Chicago team and you go, who's your first baseman? Who's your second baseman? Who's your shortstop? Right. And so I said this year. I think it was during the Wrigley series. It might not have been, it might have been on this. Uh, yeah. I think it was that the last series of the season. I said, when we do this exercise for, for, for years, it was always, you know, Tim Anderson's a nice player, but Javi's the guy you got to take Javi. I said that that's no longer the case. I said, Tim Anderson is a better player than Javier Baez. And you know how a Cub fan's going to take it. It's me trashing, you know, the El Mago, and that is not what I was doing. Uh, I was paying what I thought was the highest compliment to TA by saying he's a better player. And, and, and for, for a broadcaster, that, that credibility matters a lot to me. It doesn't matter to everybody. It may not matter to anybody else, but I have to have the ability to say that. And so that's my answer. Like, He's the best shortstop in Chicago and doesn't mean that Javi's not going to have an amazing year next year. And we can have the debate and it can be even like Javi's a better defender. Um, Tim's a better hitter. And I think Tim's offense has been so great and his energy and his leadership, all that stuff. He's one of my favorite players to watch. Yeah. I, I, I know it was during the series at our ballpark because we turned it into a half inning segment because we were getting tweets about what you said (laughs) <laughs> about Tim Anderson. And so I think the next half inning, I said, can we just stop with all this? Can we just agree that there are two really good shortstops? Yeah. And I think it was like 92 to four Cubs at that point. So I'm surprised we left it <laughs> in the half inning, if we're being honest. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, look, 
the, the Cubs have great players and the Cubs won a World Series four years ago. And it's a fun series and it's fantastic for baseball. And like Chicago is a great baseball town. We've you and I have always uh, agreed on that completely. And, you know, I, I laugh that you ended up in the crosshairs of the rivalry <laughs> over the past couple of days. Like the range of what people have said, some people are like, uh, you know, you're you're traitorous. And I, you know, I don't. I've known you for a while. I don't get like the Matahari vibe from you. <laughs> no, no, I, I never felt that way. Um, I, I've always felt during the Crosstown series in particular that we may have eyeballs on our broadcast from either fans of both teams, uh, especially from White Sox fans who hate Benetti. Like I knew that there was like a small pocket Hey, of that group. Yeah, put me in the screen, Brian Davis. I don't want, I don't want to pull in for hate Benetti. No, I don't think it's a large group. But, you know, you're, you you really haven't arrived at, at this level if you don't have somebody who just doesn't think oh, yeah. you're, you're, you're any good. Um, but uh, I, I've always prided myself on being fair to the other team. But, you know, that part of it was never difficult for me. Um, I'm sure I took some heat from, from Cub fans prior to the Tim Anderson <laughs> comment of, you know, why are you being so nice to the White Sox? It's like when you watch it, when you watch a ball game, you, you know, in the past 16 years, I would hope you'd know that this is a Cubs guy. This is our guy, but he's not going to lie to us. If there's a replay and he knows that Rizzo was out, he's not going to say, I think he was safe. Uh, the rule book. I, I, I'm a big, big, big fan of, of the rule book. I have a lot of umpire uh, friends and supervisors whom I rely on a lot to try to get all these crazy rules right. So that's what motivates me is to get it right. And in the in the in the cross on thing, you know, I have a I've always had a lot of friends with with the White Sox, and and it, it never occurred to me. To, to, to try to dig at them in any way. And if I ever did, it would be a shot at AJ, who's a buddy of mine. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the uh, I, people felt like when I said the thanks Cubs thing, that that was a dig at the Cubs. I, I don't feel that. I don't dislike the Cubs at all. It was a moment for the White Sox that was a celebrate. Now I sound like Tim Anderson, right? Like I wasn't flipping my bat at the other team. Right. I was trying to pump up my own team, but that's really you. That's what you want as an announcer. Like I'm sure you've lost yourself in moments because you just get so emotional for the people you care about. That's right. And and the the home run call, I guess I'm most remembered for was the Ramirez homer in 07 to beat Milwaukee. And in the big picture, it was the game that kind of turned around the first year of Lou Pinella's tenure with the Cubs. I think we were six or seven back in the division. And, and after that game, the Cubs were the best team in, in the Central that year. But what made that so emotional is you set up this big spot. The crowd's going crazy. Ninth inning. Aramis Ramirez steps in. Francisco Cordero's the pitcher. And, you know, typically those at-bats, it's like, Breaking ball called strike one or just off the outside or fouled away. And then like at the 2-2 two -two pitch, boom, it was first pitch slider, gone. So I set up a moment that I thought might take three minutes to, to, to happen. And it happened in about four seconds. You, you don't become Vince Scully, at least I didn't. You know, I became crazy fan Len in the booth and I just absolutely lost my mind. And that's the call that every Cubs fan remembers. And it's instructive that every once in a while you can do that. It's okay. Yeah, we, you, we're all human and living this together. And I think that's that's what I'm so excited about when people can be in the ballpark again. Is like, I, I, I don't know about you. It's going to be like, I've never been to Carnival and I've never been to the French Quarter for Mardi Gras. But I feel like it's going to be that. That's right. Yeah. I've been to New Orleans for Super Bowl week and uh, that's kind of that's kind of the vibe you're talking about. Yeah. I've done Vegas for New Year's and I barely made it out. <laughs> there were right, like so, in the street. <laughs> so, so Vegas. So I love Vegas. I've been going there every year uh, with the Cubs in spring training. Uh, I've been there a couple of times otherwise, but and and anyone who's from Vegas or lives in Vegas or 
loves it dearly. Do not take this the wrong way, but like I'm the 24 hour to 36 hour max Vegas guy. Oh yeah. How, how are you about that? So I, 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 yeah, I was in Reno for a game with Dockage uh, in February and we spent 48 hours at the sports book, just watching games, hanging out. <laughs> and I'm telling you the sh like the shower I needed, <laughs> It was like, it was it's, like, it's like a, it's like a piece of rich chocolate cake where the first bite is just the most amazing thing ever. And after four bites, you're like, I think I'm going to die from a sugar high. Yeah, this is, this is unacceptable. <laughs> if this is every meal for the rest of my life. It's going to be a week and that's it. Uh, so I know you're a huge music guy. I, I, let's do a little lightning round here. I know you're a huge music guy. Who is the band that you love considering like, how knowledgeable you are about music and all the off the beaten path bands that you love. Who's the band that Len Casper loves that people would be shocked by? Ooh, shocked by. Yeah, like oh, like man. they're a little like they're a little known for being crappy. Like, I don't know, who whoever it is. I'm I'm uh, gonna look here just to um, make sure I'm not missing anybody. Cause what whenever I get asked music questions, my tastes kind of go all over the place and then I go, oh, I should have said this. All right, I got one for you. Yeah. Sammy Hagar, solo, pri previous to Van Halen, Sammy Hagar. He had like three or four killer songs that to this day, I absolutely love. And the other one would be Rick Springfield. Rick Springfield had some really good, really good tunes back in the early 80s. I know one. <laughs> Jesse's girl. Yeah, mom. I think I speak for everybody when I say I know I know one. <laughs> he had a few more. I'll send you a couple. Who's the uh, Who's the person in your phone that's the coolest? Other than you? Oh boy. <laughs> hmm. Again, mine's 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 easy. Mine's Mike Shore. He did he did yeah. the baseball game with me two years ago and I like I couldn't be or last year and I couldn't I couldn't be more excited to know that creative genius of a human. Yeah, my first thought was Eddie Vedder. Um, with all due respect to Eddie, as cool as he is, um, he's almost too famous for, for this answer, right? You're you're looking for a little quirky. Probably David Cross. You know David Cross? Oh yeah. Yeah, he's a Arrested buddy. development to bias right. to bias uh Funke. I'll go David Cross. All right. So he's our first podcast guest because I want to meet him. Um, he's awesome. You'll love him. That's exciting. Uh, um, I had another lightning round question and I can't think of it. That's Oh, oh, who's the person that's not in your phone that you want to meet? Paul Westerberg, the lead singer of The Replacements. He's the, uh, the, the one rock star I haven't met. And guess where he lives? Minneapolis. Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> he's a Twins fan. So if he's at Target Field and you guys get a shot of him, I might literally tell DJ, I might do a hawk. I might say, DJ, you've got this for an inning. I'm not checking on for Todd Frazier. I'm going to go down and I'm going to meet Paul Westerberg. And then you, now you know that when your camera guy goes back to the shot of Paul Westerberg and I'm down there shaking his hand and he's looking at me like, who is this person? You can tell the story that. Len is doing this because he's Paul is his hero and he's never met him. I love that. My mine, and I'm gonna say this just because it hasn't happened. Mine is John Mullaney, the comedian. And there was a time about a year and a half ago where anytime somebody interviewed me, I found a way to work John Mullaney into the interview <laughs> because I think he's such a wonderful performer that I thought maybe, just maybe, if I kept getting his name into interviews, I might somehow get to meet him. We've got to make that happen. Is he a Chicago guy? He is. is. He is. Yeah. Oh, is. done. We'll make it happen. He is, and I like. I've asked around a little bit. Uh, I think there's like borderline restraining order stuff going on with how many times I've mentioned his name. But I just saw a bit that he did on Kimmel where like the Secret Service investigated him for something he said on SNL. So I think he's used to people having a file on him. <laughs> got it. Got it. You're, so you're he, worth if you, met, if, if you met him and had him in the booth, would you, you'd put him on the air. What, what would be the first thing you would ask him? Uh, you're here? Uh, no, 
I would want to know how he learned to deliver jokes with such a cadence that makes people laugh all the time. Like, how did you learn your delivery? That's a good because question. I never, like, people don't laugh at me. <laughs> Thank you. Sympathy you laugh. No, it wasn't. Appreciate it. Was, appreciate it. it was you, you never did the minors. Is that true? I never did. I did a, a small handful of games just to get some tape for the Brewers people uh, back in 97, 98. But it was like I did three innings in Beloit with Brett Dolan, uh, who at one time uh, was one of the Astros voices. I literally called Brett and I said, hey, would you have a problem if I had a free weekend came down and hung out with you? And he was working alone. And he said, yeah. So we became really good friends, and uh, I just needed to hand an inning or two to the Brewers to show them that I was competent. Um, but yeah, my my most of my kind of practice, so to speak, to get good at this was doing big league games on television. Believe it or not, I um I have news for you uh, <laughs> that I, I should I probably should have broken to you on the phone or some or like over dinner at some point. Uh, when I first, I did like 10 years in the minors and my first couple of weeks with the Sox, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting used to the team. People are getting used to me. They, they don't need a depth of stories to get to know me because they're getting to know me. And then I realized about three months into the season, nobody cared about my minor league stories with the triple A nationals and the single A Astros. Like I have all these, like I was in Kinston, North Carolina and there was, uh, you know, uh, 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 a chicken tender sub that ended up on the floor. Like nobody cares. And so <laughs> I got to say, nobody cares about all your cub stories anymore. That's you a good get point. Stories. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I'm sure you have notes of players on other teams and moments against the White Sox, just to jog your memory, whether it was yep. A three homer game against you know the team or a huge error. You know, remember this game, Stoney, or whatever. And I've, yes, I've got a lot of yeah, I've got a lot of that stuff uh, with regard to the Cubs. But I will you know dive back into some of the the bios of, of a lot of players, and I'll rely on DJ a lot too. To I'll say, hey man, you know, make sure if if if, if there's a there's a player who it's not obvious that there was some big moment, you know, bring it up. And and you I that, you took I'm that gonna, more seriously yeah. than I meant. No, but no, but no, but uh, you know, I what I want people to know is that they're going to be there is a learning curve, and I, I look forward to genuinely going through that learning curve and like kind of stepping into something that you know it's like don't say it that way again or you know whatever it is. Like I'm I'm really comfortable in my own skin in that regard. I think I have a pretty good head start having been in Chicago. Uh, I'm not coming from some other foreign place that where you know the whole. Chicago vibe is really, uh, you know, crazy and unfamiliar to me. But, you know, I, I do look forward to like, oh, I never knew that. Th those are the things I'm, I'm pumped about in 2021. What's your, so uh, uh, you still took that more seriously than I wanted you to. The, uh, <laughs> but but I, think, I think Chicago has its own atmosphere as a baseball yeah. city. And I think we both know that uh, over a lot of years. So that that's the fun part for me. Uh, you dug up a photo of, of me and you at Harry Carey's. We had dinner with your wife, yeah. Pam, a couple years ago, which is uh, remarkable. And we're standing there with, with the, the head of Harry Carey, the statue, uh, out front. And it's that's truly amazing. We, there, was a, there was a discount on puffy coats. <laughs> I got nothing for you. I can't follow no. that. No. <laughs> I, uh, what's, your, what's your worst? So I've had two moments as a White Sox announcer, uh, and, and I'm not trying to get you in trouble. So I guess Brian will edit this out if it's bad enough and disqualifying. But I want to throw it out there, and if it's funny, then great. I've had two moments – food-wise on the air that have been really bad for me. Number one, when Stoney told everybody my first year in spring training that I had ketchup on my hot dog in the press room in Goodyear. There were no condiments. It was either plain leathery hot dog with nothing on it 
or ketchup. And I chose ketchup and I'm still feeling the effects of that. <laughs> then a couple years ago, we had like a nacho helmet shot in Target Field. And somebody had this huge, like snow capped mountain of uh, sour cream. And I said, sour cream is gross. And I stand by this. But those are those they're two really bad food moments in my life. What is your uh, what is your food take that some people do not appreciate? I love peanut butter cookies. I hate peanut butter. It's a I know it's un American. It's a textural thing. Uh, I don't mind the smell of peanut butter. I love butter. I love peanuts. But the combo of the, the you know, the peanut butter jelly sandwich, I just doesn't do it for me. And I think I mentioned it on the air once and just, you know, got absolutely blasted. The other the other food on the air bit was uh, our good friend, Mark Brady, uh, who produced Cubs games. He came up with the idea like five years ago because uh, of a JD more, more than me, but he would always find the signature item in the ballpark because we don't get to partake in a lot of the, right, the concessions and he brought up Rocky Mountain oysters when we were in Denver. Now, do you know what those are? They are um, they are uh, a part of a bull that you might also, I believe, it's a bull. Is that right? Yes. Uh, that you might also, if you lived in a southern state, attach to the back of your truck. That's right. <laughs> So that was a little perilous trying to like explain what Rocky Mountain oysters were, but I have to tell you, they were really good. No, they were. No, they were really good. They're breaded. You, you, come on. It's breaded uh, meat. It, you, it, come on. Uh, what are you most excited about for this coming season? As we, I'm, I'm realizing we've gone long in our first chat here. We've gone long, which is a prelude to whatever this podcast and our multimedia ventures are going to be. Um, what's, what are you most excited about? Well, I could name about 15 things, but I'll just give you two that just popped into my head. I think hitting the air for the first time with DJ uh, in spring training will be one of those kind of seminal moments for me. Uh, in my life and career. And then number two is just, I want fans in the ballpark. Yeah. I, I'm just, I'm looking forward to the day when 20% capacity, whatever it is that people can be in the ballpark, watching the action in person. And that'll start to feel like we're getting back to normal. It is so good to be in a box with you. <laughs> uh, I could not agree more. I uh, cannot wait. Happy holidays, happy new year. Uh, I think a lot of people are ready for uh, 2020 to be over. There were some great things that happened in 2020. There was uh, a lot of bad, but 2021 uh, is gonna be awesome and I can't wait. Me too. So glad to have you uh, on board and in our fair ballpark and in our lives uh, and just to run into you in hallways and things like that. So uh, thank you for uh, now I'm going to start to sound like Bill Walton. Thank you for your life. <laughs> no, welcome. Sincerely. You're welcome for my life. <laughs> Len Casper, new radio play-by-play -play voice of the White Sox. He'll also do some TV with me and Stoney. I'm so pumped. <laughs>